Good morning, Park Cities. How are you today? All right. Wow, I love this enthusiasm. By the way, um, it's, it's okay. First of all, it's really great to be here. I'm so happy to be here. If you don't know me, my name is Han. I'm the worship pastor here in the Great Hall. And normally you might see me with a guitar or a handheld mic singing into it. But today I'm going to play a little bit of a different role. And uh, I kind of need your help today. I'm wondering if you can help me out. Um, I'm okay with loud amens and and shouts even. If, if you agree with something, I want you to just say amen. How about that, church? Amen. amen. All right. I was like, do you agree with me or not? Maybe you don't want to do that. Um, uh, yeah, I really don't mind that. So it helps me get going, and, and it also affirms the truth of God in this place, and I believe that's what we're all about. So if you're joining us online today, we want to welcome you as well. I want to ask that you would do the same thing, even in your living room, if, even if you're by yourself. Say amen and, and affirm the truth of God uh, as we dive into the word together. Before we do anything, though, I do want to ask that God would be with us and uh, guide our time together. So would you join me in a word of prayer uh, as we we approach the word of God? Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for all that you are. Lord, we acknowledge your presence in this place. We acknowledge your presence, Lord, in this moment, in this holy moment, Lord. We ask, Lord, that you would make yourself known in our hearts, that our minds be fixed on you. God, I believe that throughout the week, you've been preparing each and every one of us for this message today. And you have been doing a work in our lives, in our hearts, and we're so grateful for that. So having said that, God, I pray that, uh, that, that my words would not get in the way of that, Lord, rather that, that it would come alongside that work so that you would be lifted up and that this church, Park City's church, would be a kind of church that lives out the word of God in a way that honors you and also in a way that is a witness to others as well. God, we thank you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Well, we are in the Fruit of the Spirit series. Uh, Pastor Jeff had mentioned that. So I thought the first thing we would do is go to Galatians chapter 5, remind ourselves of some of the fruits that we have talked about, And then I'll dive into the fruit that we'll be talking about um, today, which is gentleness. But let's read together. So if you're you're online, if you're joining us online, read out loud with us as well. So Galatians 5, 22 through 23, here's the word of God. And it says this, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Amen. Amen. So if you are joining us for the first time, we've been going through this series on the fruits of the Spirit, and we've actually been assigning real fruit to the fruits that we've been talking about. So for example, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about kindness and how kindness is like the grape, and that grapes come in bunches, uh, much like kindness comes in small packages. Uh, But my personal favorite was the sermon on patience and how patience is like the pineapple, Uh, because the pineapple takes forever to grow, um, and even after you get it, it takes forever to actually get into the fruit. But once you get into it, it is so worth it. I love that. I love that. Well, today we'll be talking about gentleness and gentleness. And today we're going to be talking about the avocado as well. Um, And we're saying that gentleness is the avocado because the avocado is made ready when it is soft to the touch. Also, we're saying that the uh, avocado is like gentleness, and that gentleness comes from a warm and caring place, much like the avocado is grown in warm climates. Now, church, I have to admit to you, I was a little surprised as I was doing research on the avocado. Uh, we, we try to be thorough with the fruits here. Uh, we, as you know, we talk about the fruits a little bit, and we try to connect it uh, with the fruits of the Spirit. But I thought it was very interesting, and I was a little bit shocked to see this, that the avocado, when it comes to popularity, in terms of the rankings, um, and and I looked this up, worldatlas.com, you can look it up yourself, um, uh, measured by production and metric tons. Uh, There was a ranking of of fruits, popular fruits. The avocado, church, was ranked dead last. 
Can you believe that? I mean, I know, well, I'm in Texas. I came from California. I was in the church in California. I mean, avocado is huge there, right? And I know here, everyone loves guacamole. Except I know, I actually, I met a few people in the nine o'clock service. They said, I actually don't like avocado. Actually, you're in the same boat with my wife, so you're in good company. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was surprised because I know the avocado is a big thing here as well as California, but it is ranked dead last. I was very much surprised at that. And I was surprised because the avocado is considered a superfood. Just a a couple of more facts. The avocado is chock full of protein, chock full of fiber, and it's very, very good for your cholesterol, apparently. Um, But but it was was a surprise to me when after seeing all of that and seeing that it was ranked dead last. Well, if there is a fruit that I am thankful to God for, spirit of the fruits that is, it is the fruit of gentleness. And yet, like the avocado, it's pretty underrated. Maybe perhaps for you, it's ranked dead last on a list of, of the spirit of the fruits. In fact, there was a Dutch reformer by the name of George Bethune, and he said this about gentleness, which I can totally amen this because uh, I'm guilty. Uh, perhaps no grace is less prayed for or less cultivated than gentleness. I, I don't know about you, but I can't remember the last time I prayed for the spirit of gentleness in my life. I can't remember the last time I asked God to help me be more gentle in certain uncomfortable situations. Well, I think that gentleness is a little underrated because perhaps it's a little bit misunderstood. After all, this world looks at gentleness as weakness. Maybe it's seen as spinelessness. Maybe it's seen as passive in a way that's not helpful for things like business and ministry and leadership. I totally get that. But when we look at scripture, I think you'll you'll see that gentleness is something different entirely. The Greek word that's often used is the word proutis, proutis. And proutis is actually defined as gentleness, but it's also defined as meekness. Uh, And we all know what Jesus said about meekness. He said, blessed are the meek, for theirs is the kingdom of God. It's a big deal. Gentleness and meekness, they're a big deal. So, What I want to do before we dive into this topic is I want to try to define gentleness for you in the most simple way possible so that there's really no misunderstanding on what this is and what we're actually talking about today. So here it is. This is the definition. Let's hold on to this one. Gentleness is strength under control. Gentleness is strength under control. And if you see scripture and as we look at our passage today or passages today, you'll see that that is ideally Um, the case. Now, if you ask me, I would say that we need to find ways to elevate this fruit, being that it is underrated, being that it's so under the radar, even for the most seasoned believer, we need to find ways to elevate this fruit. Because church, let's remember the fruit of the spirit. It's it's not a pick and choose kind of thing. It's not a, I'm going to exercise this when it's more convenient for me. You know, I think I'm going to be kind to this person because I just kind of feel that way. Or, or I think maybe I'll be more loving towards this person just because that's just the way I feel today. And I think similarly, gentleness is, is the same way where we can approach it and say, you know what, per- gentleness is really not my thing. It's really not me. And, and I know there are times when I felt the same way where I was saying that in my head. It's like, well, this is really not something I, I'm, I feel like doing today. Church, the fruits of the Spirit. We are all called to produce, all of them, at all times. Amen? We are all called to produce the fruits. So overlooked, underrated, underestimated, however you used to see the fruit of gentleness, I don't want to let the perception of gentleness cloud your thoughts into seeing the life-changing nature of gentleness, because gentleness will change your life, and it will change the life of the people around you. Gentleness is a super fruit. It's a super fruit, and it will also allow you to stand out in the midst of a culture that is so divided and, and, and so angry. This is a fruit that we need to elevate in our lives. We must elevate gentleness. And so today, this is what I want to do. I I want to talk about how we can 
elevate this fruit, we talk about three needs. We need three things to elevate this fruit. The first thing we need is an embrace of gentleness. We need to embrace gentleness. Number two, we need a standard of gentleness. And number three, we need a response to gentleness. So let's talk about that first thing, an embrace. For this point, I'd like to bring in our memory verse for the week, uh, which comes from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. So church, let's read this all together. And uh, for those of you joining at home as well, let's, let's read this out loud. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Amen. So that phrase, to make a defense, is actually the Greek word apologion, which is where we get the word apologetics, as many of you might have guessed. But it's also very plainly translated as to give a response back to, to give a response back to. Now, you probably know this, but we can give a response back to people in a number of ways, especially if we are on the defense, if we're being confronted with someone, it is very easy to give a response back to someone in a very non-gentle way. Uh, This is why I love what Peter says at the end. He says, do this, yet do this with gentleness and respect. And this is consistent with how the scriptures calls us to embrace a life of gentleness. You might Uh, You might know this verse, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1. A soft or gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And church, how relevant is this, especially in the season that we're in right now? I know election day has come and gone, but man, the conversations are still happening. The outrage is still happening. I mean, just because election day has gone does not mean that the conversations have stopped. With so much of our nation divided on a myriad of issues, it is so easy to give a response back in a way that is not gentle and that is not with respect. So church gentleness, and this is where I'm I'm trying to draw us in, gentleness is what will separate you from the rest of the world, from the rest of the noise that we're hearing on social media. And trust me, I'm on social media and my head spins by the end of the day looking at all this stuff going on. And church, can I also say that gen- gentleness is also sometimes not saying anything at all. Sometimes we need not engage and in- involve ourselves in certain conversation. And, and trust me, I know how hard that is, especially if some of you in here are outraged at certain things or there are certain issues just that get your blood boiling. Maybe there are certain politicians or certain people that just get under your skin. It is hard to give a response back to apologion without gentleness, without respect. And so this is what I'm saying, is that when we embrace gentleness, it's not only our behavior towards people that change, but it's our devotion to them that changes as well. And when I think about a gentle person in my life, I think about my mentor and uh, his wife. They both live in Korea. They have a ministry. They just celebrated their 10-year anniversary of their church plant. Uh, it's an international church that um, started with five people and then ended up, n- now there are over 2,000 people in attendance. Um, it's an incredible ministry, but it's led by two very gentle people. Um, uh, my mentor's wife in particular, her name is Heather, and she is really the, the epitome of gentleness. I think about her. There was one instance where I remember we were serving together in Maryland, and there was a particular church member that gave her a hard time. Uh, In fact, spread gossips and and lies about her, and and it really hurt her. And it got to the point where even as staff, we were thinking, we should say something. We should do something. We should stand up for Heather and do something about this. And Heather had every right to respond back and say, look, this is not right. And even rebuke. You know, she had every right to respond in that way. But instead, what she did was pray and fast. I don't know about you, but I, I've fasted before, and I've fasted for the church. I've fasted for myself, certainly, and for people I love, certainly. But I, I don't think I, I've ever really fasted for someone who I disagree with, or somebody I'm angry at, or somebody I, I, I don't like. It, it's hard to do that, and yet this godly woman 
This gentle woman fasted for this person who gave her a hard time. That was her response. Her response was not to engage, was not to rebuke or retaliate. It was to pray and fast. And the end result of that was reconciliation and repentance. After praying, this church member, this disgruntled church member said that she was praying and the Holy Spirit convicted her. And she went to Heather and apologized for everything she had done and said, all of the things I said were complete lies and I'm so sorry. So the end result of this godly woman's gentleness was reconciliation and repentance. Sound familiar, church? This is much the way that the Holy Spirit works with us. It says that Jesus is kindness. His kindness is what leads us to repentance. So church, that begs the question, has our gentleness ever led another person to repentance and reconciliation? Author and pastor Ray Ortland said this, and I love this quote. He says, To the degree that we have renounced pushiness and embraced gentleness, we are making the real Jesus visible in our world today, which is success, no matter what else might happen to us. So my point here is that gentleness must be embraced because it must be a part of us. It's not something that we simply do in spurts or when it's convenient for us but it's something that we have to embrace as a lifestyle. This is not about behavior modification, and this is not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is devoting ourselves to one another and devoting ourselves more deeply with Jesus. That's what I'm talking about. And that's what I mean by embracing gentleness. And when we do that, we're embracing people. We're we're embracing a, a God who loves us and knows us and not just changing our behavior. And we do this because of the way of Christ, because we're called to imitate Christ in everything he does. And that's a challenge I know, but that's because he's our standard. Jesus is our standard of gentleness, and that's the second thing we need. We need the standard that we can look to. So I want to talk about that a bit. You know, I I think about Jesus in, in his ministry and how not only was this his defining characteristic, But you see gentleness throughout his ministry. You see it throughout in in so many different ways. But I want to point to one particular scene in John chapter 13, verses 3 through 5. And while you're turning there in your Bibles, let me just set the scene up for you. This uh, This is when Jesus washes his disciples' feet, which is like the most backwards thing a rabbi can do in this moment. And yet it stands as one of the most powerful examples of leadership and ministry that we can see. So let's look at that scene. John chapter 13, verses three through five. Jesus, knowing that the father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. You know, like I said, there were a lot of examples of gentleness in Jesus' ministry, but I picked this one because it had a different angle to gentleness. You know, the word for gentle, praus, it's actually also defined as this, not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance. Praus is defined, or gentle, not being overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance. So Jesus reveals his gentleness, especially in this scene, with humility. And church, those two things go hand in hand. Gentleness and humility, they go hand in hand. And I want you to see that as well. And I want you to also put yourself in this situation, in this room. I mean, think about the, this is the most esteemed person in the room who desires all praise and adoration. And yet he goes down, stoops down, and does the most humble thing a person can do and washing his disciples' stinky and smelly feet. Unbelievable. And yet what's funny is that in the Luke account, in this exact same scene, the disciples were actually arguing about who was the greatest. You see the opposite ends here? Jesus portraying a, servant, uh, a servant-like attitude and mentality that is essentially teaching these disciples that, no, that's not the way. This is the way, and let me show you, let me show you. Jesus, church, was a servant leader 
who led with his gentleness. Now, this idea of being impressed with uh, one's self-importance is, of course, something that Jesus taught against. And coincidentally, it's also one of the reasons why I believe non-Christians are so turned off by Christians. In fact, um, according to a 2019 Barna Research Group survey, it says 47% of millennials, 47% agree that, quote, it is wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in hopes that they will one day, one day share the same faith. 47%. There's a book called A Gentle Answer, which I highly recommend, especially for the times that we're living in. Uh, it's written by Scott Sauls, and, and in this, he actually affirms this, and he says this, A reason for the shift from favor to disfavor towards Christians is that many people today perceive that Christians lack humility, approachability, and empathy. Ask the average skeptic, agnostic, or atheist what they think Christianity stands for, and they will likely respond by saying that Christianity is about being right, acting superior in your rightness, and injuring people with your rightness. Can you imagine that? Injuring people with your rightness. We have the most amazing message to share. We have the most amazing message God who knows us and loves us and approached us with his gentleness so that we may have life. And yet this is what the agnostics, the skeptics are saying. They are injuring, that we are injuring with our rightness. I don't know about you, but that's incredibly convicting for me. The kind of gentleness that Jesus displays upon washing the disciples' feet, this is a different kind of gentleness, church. It's the kind that would challenge skeptics and agnostics in their view and what they might think about us and who we follow. Our servant-like actions and demeanors is not only different, but it's also countercultural, especially given the season that we're in, as I mentioned earlier. So upon washing the disciples' feet, you can understand why Jesus says this, and I hope this speaks to all of us in here John 13, 15, Jesus says, For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Jesus is our standard of gentleness. In a world that glorifies self-importance, in a world that glorifies self-centeredness, he is our standard. But church, let me just, let me go a little bit deeper and say that in order to understand biblical gentleness, I believe we also need to learn how to respond to gentleness as well, which is our third need. I don't believe that we will know Christ's gentleness until we've experienced his gentleness and his ministry. Jesus extends a hand to everyone. Uh, We see this in Matthew 11. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. I know we've read this before as a church, and we've seen this before as a church. Uh, but I want us to pinpoint on the gentleness of Jesus here. Jesus says this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I don't believe this scene is Jesus just saying, if you need me, I'll be here. If you run into some trouble, I'll be around. I believe this is Jesus saying, this is me. I am gentle and lowly in heart. We all need rest, amen? We all need rest from time to time. Perhaps right now you are in need of rest. You're in a tough season right now and you're just longing to find rest. Well, Jesus is calling you to him, saying, not only come to me, but know that I am gentle and lowly in heart. So church, this is what I'm trying to say with this point, and please don't miss this, because for those of you who need rest, you might need to hear this. Sometimes gentleness is surrender. Sometimes gentleness is surrender. In our most challenging times, in our most challenging moments of life, I believe God is leading you He is leading us, saying, 
I know you think you can do it. I know you can muscle your way through the situation, but let me instead. I believe that's what God is saying to some of us today. You think that, that by working hard and muscling your way through a difficulty, and maybe even pushing God out of the equation and just getting it over with can do the trick. But here's what I'm saying is that Jesus is saying, no, I know you think you can do it, but let me instead. Come to me, right? Come to me, all you who are weary, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. Church, this is how we can respond to a gentle God and also how we come to be gentle ourselves. Amen? So today, I talked essentially about how we can elevate gentleness in our lives, and I talked about three needs that we, we have to have in our lives, and that's, to, that's an embrace of gentleness, that's also a standard of gentleness, and a response to gentleness. Well, if there's one thing that I can point to, one truth that I can point to, if you've forgotten everything I've said today, I hope you haven't, but if you've forgotten everything I've said today, I want you to hold on to this one truth, and it's this. Gentleness is elevated when we get close to Jesus. Ultimately, all of my needs, all the needs that we talked about, all my points are leading to this one truth. At the end of the day, I just want you to get close to Jesus because I know that if you can just get close to Jesus, to the one who is gentle, that you will not only experience his, his ministry and his gentleness, but you will have your life changed. And then you will also change the lives of the people around you. So church, I want to end um, with a time of prayer, if I can, if I may. If you've ever served with me in the past, if you've served with me in church's past, you'll know that this is sort of my thing, okay? So at the end of every message, I, I like to invite people to receive prayer um, by a simple gesture. So I, in a moment, I want to pray for you. And uh, if you want to receive prayer, I simply want to ask that you place your hand over your heart. And the gesture itself is not some magical formula or magical thing. It's just a simple gesture to say, God, I'm taking one small step a little bit closer to you, and I, and I want to, to show you that, that I'm, I'm going to commit to this. And so I, I want to extend prayer to a few groups of people, and I, I know that we're all in different circumstances of dealing with different things. And if you're a believer in this room, maybe after hearing this message, maybe a person popped into your head. Maybe a group of people popped into your head. Uh, my prayer for you, and, and if you need prayer for this, I want to pray for you, um, is that you would find ways to be gentle to that person. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's an opponent. Maybe it's somebody who came after you because of your political views. Maybe it's somebody that you know at work. But if that person popped up into your head um, and you need strength today to show gentleness to that person, just want you to place your hand over your heart and I'll pray for you. I also want to pray for those uh, who may be watching or in this room maybe who have a bunch of questions about faith. Maybe for you, God is not so gentle. He hasn't been gentle. Boy, he's been anything but gentle in my life. If you're in this room and you have questions about God and you have questions about his gentleness, I hope, first of all, I hope that this message has opened your eyes to see his gentleness and to see his invitation, more importantly, to come to him, to find salvation, to, to find healing in his name. I hope that that has been the case. But at the very least, if you have questions about the faith, if you have questions about Jesus, we would love to talk with you. If you're watching online, I, I wanna encourage you to type, type a message, to, to reach out, we want to reach out and help you answer any questions that you might have. Afterwards, I'll be uh, in the hallway uh, next door. Uh, and, and if you have questions for us, uh, we'll have a team there ready to talk with you, uh, ready to converse with you. And we hope and pray that that's really the first step. The first step in a relationship with God that will allow you to not only experience his gentleness, but for you to be gentle yourself. Because I stand by that, that gentleness will change your life and will change the life of the people around you. So if you need prayer for any reason, I just want you to place your hand over your heart 
And I just want to pray over you today as we close. So church, let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you for your gentleness. We thank you for the example that you set for us. There are so many times, Lord, when we perhaps felt like you weren't gentle. Maybe we got into trouble on our own and, and we've just blamed things on other people and on you. And man, we're just tired and we need rest from that. Jesus, thank you for calling us to yourself for we see that you are gentle and lowly in heart. Lord, if we have not seen you as gentle, Lord, show us the truth. Open our eyes to who you really are. God, there are some people in this room, there are some people watching online right now uh, who desire to be more gentle to a person that maybe they thought of while they were listening to the sermon. God, give us strength. God, give us grace for others. I pray that our hearts would align with yours so that we can extend grace and gentleness in our response. Help us with that, Lord. We need your help with that. May we respond back with gentleness and respect. God, I also pray for those who have questions, who have major issues with our faith major issues with maybe even who you are. First of all, Holy Spirit, would you open our eyes to who you really are, but also that you would allow us to experience healing. If there is anybody watching, even now, who have questions, Lord, I know that they're here for a reason, that they're watching for a reason. So I pray in this moment, right now, Lord Jesus, would you do your work of ministry, draw them closer to you right now so that they can experience your gentleness. Help us with that, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be gentle, and to be an example to the world. Thank you, Lord, we love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.